and with the mid 21s i dare say we are able to teach the mirage guys the lesson or two just go through clear take off left hand take off left Hello and welcome to the Blue Skies podcast. I'm PR Ganapati, your host. It's my great pleasure today to welcome to the podcast Group Captain Murli Menon. Group Captain Menon was commissioned into the fighter stream of the Indian Air Force in 1974. and he retired from service many years later after thousands of hours on the MiG-21 and the MiG-23 he flew almost 1800 hours on the MiG-21 and about 800 plus hours on the MiG-23 he commanded the uh, 224 squadron the warlords flying MiG-23 aircraft he was a pilot attack instructor he stood first in the pilot attack instructor course and was then invited to be an instructor in the pilot attack instructor school He also stood first in the fighter combat leader course, and uh, won a YSN medal for writing the first Air Force doctrine. Welcome to the program, Group Captain Menon. Thank you very much, Guns. We are truly fortunate to have you with us today. You're, uh, you know, truly the sort of fighter jock that we all imagine a fighter pilot to be. But uh, I'd love it if you start us off by taking us back to. your childhood where you grew up and what was the inspiration or motivation to join the armed forces and particularly the air force actually i grew up in kerala i didn't have anybody uh, in the immediate family who belonged to the defense forces at all but i believe as a child i used to keep telling my mom that i want to be a pilot like any child does you know every boy wants to be either a pilot or he wants to be a policeman right so so there was this uh, yearning to be a pilot all right but then i think the whole thing started off when i made it into the sainik school in trivandrum and thereafter into the national defense academy so it was al- almost as so you know it was a, a tailor made kind of a, a path for me which was laid out by somebody up there thank you sir yeah. you know the sainik schools have been fascinating because uh, in some sense uh, they prepare people who have no exposure whatsoever to the armed forces to a uh, career in the armed forces and they produce so many air marshals and chiefs and generals that it's uh, quite a national institution just uh, you know without spending too much time on it i just love to hear your perspective and your experience of joining sainik school uh, why did your family decide to put you in a sainik school in the first place and what was it like actually the reason for putting me into a sainik school uh, might seem a little flippant but the fact was that i was uh, uh, pretty okay in my academics but i was extremely active in the outdoors and in all kinds of games so my father thought that maybe i will of course my father had a yearning that one of his sons we were four of us one should get into the military uh, he himself was in the royal army at one stage so he wanted me to get into the military and that is how the sainik school came then i went in for the examination and the interview and made it to the the sainik school but uh, the sainik school in trivandrum which is one of the earlier ones to start uh, you know as you know this was a, a, a brain child of uh, the, the defense minister then defense minister vk krishnamanan and uh, they were actually feeders into the national defense academy you know so they and our school specifically did extremely well in this uh, aspect at every year it used to for several years on end it used to send the maximum number of uh, uh, cadets into the national defense academy fascinating so i think one message for people who are 
keen on joining the armed forces as first get into a sainik school i think you were telling me earlier that uh, the government's decided to expand the number of sainik schools is that right yes recently the government has taken a call to bring in because uh, funding was i think turning out to be a problem for running the sainik schools so they decided to uh, uh, involve the uh, ngo sector in uh, giving the what do you call uh, the funding for the sainik schools and uh, i don't know whether that will really work out because main issue was regarding not only the fees for the students but also the pension for the staff etc so there's an issue there are people like shashi tharoor who are involved in trivandrum trying to fight this and promote the sainik schools as a concept because they have done such yeoman service in terms of feeding people into the defense forces wonderful i certainly hope they do figure out a solution to those budget challenges uh, so coming to your flying training so where did you do your flying training on which aircraft and what was that first experience of flying flying solo i know a lot of pilots remember their first solo very clearly what was that journey my god that was really something as you know you know of course a pilot's life uh, any pilot for that matter and especially for a fighter pilot it becomes even more challenging where you are hobby and your job is uh, they are you know uh, intermingle very 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 nicely you know that if you can put it you enjoy both so thoroughly yeah i remember uh, marshal rajkumar once telling me that i can't believe somebody pays me to do absolutely so i started off of course the training period during our time we i think we were fortunate to could be a heading surely towards an all jet training in the indian air force but during our time we used to go through the uh, the what you call the hindustan trainer 2 which is st2 was the basic stage and that was a real challenging aeroplane in terms of basic flying and landing especially you know it was very very very, very often one used to hear about doing a ground loop that means when you land and you're not able to control the aeroplane the aircraft used to just go around <laughs> you know describing a circle on the runway so it was quite tricky to land this aeroplane especially in a crosswind landing on an st2 was a tremendously challenging business so that was the first stage then the intermediate stage we flew on the hover and where did you do that uh, were you in alabad or in bidar no we were in bidar we were in bidar it's called mohammadabad bidar in in, in karnataka and uh, that's where we went for our basic training followed by our intermediate training on a beautiful aeroplane which is an american aeroplane called a uh, texan hover t6g and uh, that really gave us a lot of confidence and the first time we were even sent out on a cross country like we flew from hyderabad to nagpur and back landed there turned around the aircraft and brought it back so that was a tremendous experience at the intermediate stage and the final stage we used to be on vampires for us which is once again the first time we flew a jet and the vampire actually was a, a, a fighter in the true sense it had been used in war during the 65 and 71 wars also so that was how the training part went yeah one of our first interviews were with uh, a marshal ramachandran who used the vampire to sink a portuguese patrol boat Ab- absolutely in goa absolutely i i i heard about that is fascinating in fact the, so vampire was a beautiful aeroplane especially the fighter was a tremendous aircraft then of course most of the co- combat sorties could also be done on the trainer uh, that that is a vampire for you and after my training uh, i went on to you know depending on the uh, basic uh, basic aptitude which the instructors were able to gauge if you are reasonably okay then, then they wanted you to go to the big 21 stream and some other people who perhaps did not were totally cut out for the uh, fighter stream were sent out to transports and helicopters things like that so i was lucky to go into mig 21s and start up flying what is called the type 77 or the mig 21 fl as they call it that was my first aeroplane in a conversion squadron which was 45 squadron in bareilly so i started there then switched to various other squadrons four squadron for example uh, in fact your father was commanding in 28th squadron in tesco when i was in four squadron along in the same base right just across the tarmac yeah. yes yes and then thereafter i went out to three squadron pathan port and then switched my type from uh, uh, in the mig 21s i went on to mig 23s which is the ground attack version 
then did my courses and finally commanded a mig 23 air defense version squadron because they could not find somebody to command at that time there was nobody at that seniority available so i was sent to command a mig 23 mf which is in nadampo 224 squadron which is called a warlords a tremendously uh, satisfying tenure actually any command of a squadron is an ultimate for any fighter pilot so that was what we did and the speciality about this particular squadron was that i we used to operate from lay this is the only squadron that was clear to operate from lay we used to go there there were peculiarities in lay in terms of starting the aircraft especially because of the rarefied atmosphere so that was a tremendously challenging and uh, interesting tenure in one's life yeah wonderful sir thank you and we're going to get into a lot of those details a little later but uh, let's just back up to the mig 21 what was it designed for when did the indian air force acquire it and why did we acquire it and uh, tell us a little more about the type 77 what did it have by way of avionics equipment um the mig 21 as you know was designed mainly to combat the u2 aeroplane of the you know gary power fame so it was basically meant to take off zoom up to very high altitudes intercept the u2 and then land back so initially it only had missiles called the ka13 missiles later on they put on a gun pack on it so it was basically like a sports model it had a very extremely agile kind of a thing but not much of endurance and hardly any avionics on board did it have a radar yeah it had a radar it's called the r2l which was uh, the earlier version was called the r1l then the r2l which was actually a very very basic kind of a radar which was uh, as good as not having a radar frankly uh, later on of course uh, we will talk about the upgrade of the mig 21 which came and called the bison but uh, the original mig 21s were very sparsely equipped for uh, avionics radar sighting system so invariably even all the firing had to be done on fixed gun sights there was a later on of course on the, the variants mig 20 the type 96 which is the mig 21m and the bis we started having gyro gun sights and uh, but there was uh, nothing really on the type 77 so the intention was really that it would be largely ground controlled a ground controller would vector you onto your target and then you would sight it visually or using your radar and then launch your missiles absolutely the ground radar would guide you in fact uh, it may be interesting for uh, your listeners to know that the, the initial type of mig 21 was actually flown by valentina tereshkova the russian woman astronaut Oh, and wow. she she did a flying on the mig 21 yes that's quite a quite a history that the aircraft has so what was it like to fly when you when you came to your first mig squadron and saw it i must have been quite thrilling to look at it but at the same time quite nervous and intimidating because it's quite a quite a beast for the initial pilot absolutely in fact uh, one was uh, apprehensive because we had not heard about the difficulties especially of course in in combat situations uh, it was a little tricky for an ab initio pilot definitely mainly because of the very high landing speeds so you know because of that the chance uh, your uh, scope to make any mistakes especially on landing was rather limited can you give us a sense for the landing speed of the mig compared to some other you know normal fighters of modern day yeah so so a mig 21 your your threshold speed normally is in the region of 340 kilometers whereas the new aircraft which are coming including the you know rafale and everything they can actually come up with an optimum angle of attack and very close to an optimum touch down speed which is good for the aircraft for the tires everything and also for the pilot in terms of handling the landing run also so the but the big 21 fl was a little tricky and also you had a big nose in front and you could not see much ahead so you had a little issue in terms of you know judging your round out height correctly and those, those kind of issues and uh, so those were the challenges in terms of big 21 but once you got a certain number of hours under your belt then it was such a dream it was such a Uh, is a fighter pilot's aircraft in all respects in fact you know 
and the, the aircraft literally starts reacting to your uh, your commands you know, because once you have the experience then you can actually take the take her through the entire pace of uh, maneuvers mm -hmm. and she was so tolerant only thing is you cannot afford to take a chance like i said especially in combat you could get into the wrong side of the power curve as i say where you could get into a situation if you're not aware and caught up in the the the, the what was happening during a, a combat uh, training situation then people have come and cropper because of uh, not realizing that aircraft had got into a awkward situation but uh, like i said once you have a reasonable amount of uh, flying hours under your belt then this aeroplane was a dream in every which way do you remember or can you describe for us your first sortie you know one of the things we try to do in this program is have people be in the cockpit with you so walk us through that sortie if you yeah the first sortie was of course we were we had instructors who had all done their flying in russia i still remember with flying with the then squad leader goli gil he was a tremendous person to instruct me on the mig 21 trainer called the type 66 at that time in bareilly and uh, frankly the initial few sorties was just went like a verb because you know not not really with the aeroplane at all the aircraft was far ahead of you but then the instructor was so good and he told what to expect and one thing for any pilot and especially for a fighter pilot which is most important is the chair flying that means once you know that uh, you're going to fly so and so sortie the next day you actually go over the entire you know every little thing that you are likely to encounter including your the various uh, radio call and you do it any number of times so that when you actually fly things become that much easier for you because uh, you know you already rehearsed it in your mind what is likely to happen and then i think you just have to do the hand and body and the mind coordination which which is challenging all right by itself but at least it becomes a little easier if you put in a hours or chair flying behind you and so you were released to go solo on the type 77 after how many sorties in the uh, roughly in the it was in terms of number of hours about maybe about i think seven hours or so was the flying that you had required to do on the mig 21 to go solo holy cow that doesn't sound like a lot no that is not much because uh, you know the entire syllabus had been laid down over period the air recorders had checked out you know depending on the, the various experience like our batches like i told you had a kind of a ideal kind of a exposure in terms of the uh, training part that means we initially like i told you did a uh, propeller aircraft then went on to one more propeller then the jets at the advanced stage everything and then hunt we flew the hunters and then went on to make 21 so we had a nice kind of a graded and very uh, you know the gradual build up towards flying the mig 21 and uh, so that was a that is the way we went on the mig 21 the first solo on mig 21 of course was quite a exhilarating uh, business and thereafter like i said it took quite a while for us to really but then the everybody who is a supervisor flying was careful they never pushed us beyond the stage the initial stages the weather was optimal everything was good so one could actually hack it in that manner and so when you your first solo on the mig 21 uh, what was that like i'm told one thing that surprises people is the rapid acceleration once you oh yes oh yes it's, it takes about 19 odd seconds to unstick but uh, yes, once uh, the, the, the clean MiG-21 just runs out of your hand and before you realize you are airborne, you know, you, have, you, you really realize it only once you get airborne. Like I said, the challenging part would really the, the, the landing part, you know, the, once you get into the air, then get the whole, uh, you feel, start feeling, because the trainer and the fighter are quite similar. You know, there are some, some uh, uh, aircraft where the they have no trainers like the NAT, for example. Till recently, now they started having the Ajit version, which I got a two seat version. Otherwise, a lot of people, a lot of aircraft had no trainer versions. So we were lucky in this respect because MiG 21 had a trainer, and the trainer and the fighter were very similar. So the somebody could actually tell you what to expect in a fighter, and it was quite 
quite much the same, you know. So, um, how quickly after that did you start actually the operational syllabus of becoming a fighter pilot where you were learning formation flying and beginning to do some 1v1 combat? Yeah, so the, so you, you actually the syllabus puts you through the paces. You start off, like you say, initially, of course, you're just handling the aeroplane to get to feel the aeroplane, get your confidence in handling it, it across the flight pro, uh, profile that uh, it's capable of doing. So, but the, even then, you do not really push it beyond the stage because, frankly, your confidence levels haven't resource stages. And once your flying hours build up, then you start the other exercises, like you start doing tail chase, you do what you call one versus one exercises, then you get into group combat. Simultaneously, you're doing the ground attack for, you know, business where you start doing, uh, you know, air to ground firing and uh, all that thing. Then you also, once you have a certain number of hours, you start uh, being uh, pushed into leading a other aircraft. That means you, you do start doing your two aircraft leads, you do your four aircraft leads, and then you do your night flying. So once you do all this thing, the entire syllabus as it is laid down, that's when you get declared fully operational day and night on a, any particular type. So, so to say, same thing for the MiG-21. Super. So, um, you know, for those of our audience who don't know what these things are, what is the tail chase, if you can say? Tail chase is basically to, you know, it is the ultimate stage where you reach before you launch either your missile or ideally in this case, guns. Because we're, the olden era, we used to always talk about a gun kill as ultimate. You know, because that was, uh, missiles were actually few and far between in terms of capability and uh, and uh, other, uh, you know, the technology. So we used to mainly rely on the guns for a kill in that, that era war. If we're talking about this World War II era and then they're out, they're on till our, our era also. So there, uh, so you want to get into that area where you can actually fire your guns at your adversary. So to, once you get there, the adversary will naturally try and shake you off by maneuvering very aggressively in front of you. So you have to know how to hold your position behind the adversary by manipulating your throttle, your air brakes, what have you, and flying your aeroplane in relation to the adversary so that you can maintain a position from where you can achieve a kill in the few seconds to ensue. So that's what you call the tail chase. The training for that is called the tail chase exercise. Wonderful. And uh, what's a 1v1? How is that exercise different? Well, 1v1 is actually the basic, most basic, what you call also basic fighter menu, how you call it. So it is basically, uh, in olden days, there was a little bit of an ego uh, thing tied around it because it's how good a pilot you are versus how good somebody else is. So you actually, in, in, a, in an ideal situation, when you do a one versus one against any other pilot, say on a MiG-21, you would start when you're flying about three kilometers abreast of each other and start the combat from there. But then later on, because of you know some unfortunate accidents and maybe indiscretions, this was changed that a brisk combat was not permitted, mainly because of the egos and people could get into a situation where they over, uh, over uh, maneuver the aircraft beyond the capability and get into some kind of situation. But otherwise, an ultimate one, one verse one actually starts from a, a brisk situation. Then you start turning into each other, maneuver with respect to each other, and try and get into that tail chase position, what I told you about earlier. So that is when the whole thing ends. And once you get there, you get a kill, you film that kill, and then the, the, that particular situation is over. So as a, as a young officer who's fresh on the type, uh, would it be correct to say you were probably, other people were getting the better of you most of the time in the initial sorties, and then over time you got better at using the aircraft? Absolutely, absolutely. Initially, of course, uh, the more uh, when you fly with experienced people, but then once you start, uh, you know, growing out of your green on years, when you start learning the ropes, 
then you start getting the confidence that yes i can also do this i can maneuver this airplane better i can do uh, use a vertical in a better fashion so it can happen so once you have the experience like i said and of course some planning and uh, thing on the ground also goes through as so how would you maneuver then yes you 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 are maybe able to even outmatch or live up to the maneuvering of a experienced pilot yes and how would you brief and debrief these sorties how would you assess besides the gun camera picture how else would you know what somebody did so that you can give them feedback so they could improve now actually we have uh, gone on we, we, we have got uh, the entire uh, <clears throat> entire uh, system of uh, assessing the maneuver of the aircraft yeah, there are systems that record the position of various aircraft at different points in space and time so that you can plot and examine and analyze later yeah yeah absolutely yeah and so uh, how long did it take you know when you say get the hang of the aircraft begin to exploit it are we talking weeks months year no definitely it will be uh... it will be weeks weeks week, and uh, maybe may even weeks and months i would say any memorable uh, combat sorties uh, practice combat sorties from that time where you were uh, you know in a disadvantageous situation and you managed to turn tides on somebody who you know was considered to be better than you but you best yeah guns so the uh, the total number of flying that i had is close to about 3000 flying hours would translate to about 6000 sorties so those you know there are some sorties even today i recollect my the, the combat sorties that i have during training period which i have flown or some other sorties which have been of some, some interesting episodes have taken place you know like landing in lay for example or doing a, a ferry and getting into a, a cumulonimbus cloud by mistake those kind of you know which stay in your mind so there are some sorties in the, 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 during the training period the air combat phase and all that which you, and the air to ground the actual firing which you have done it stay in your mind for a long long time right if i can trouble you to take us through one of those sorties just put us in the cockpit with you describe the sortie in as much detail as you can yeah i remember one uh, uh, i was fortunate not to have any unfortunate incident ever right through my career but there was a case which i remember when i was flying uh, doing a ferry and a mig 21 bis along with my leader from patankot to kalekunda we were going for you know every squadron used to be going to kalekunda for a air to air firing once in a year so once we were going for that uh, it was during that period typical period of what they call in the east as the kal baisakhi where you have some weather elements which are not conducive to safe flying and uh, of course my leader unfortunately made a mistake of descending to avoid certain weather elements like a cumulonimbus cloud and uh, in in a jiffy i found myself also on the periphery of a cumulonimbus cloud and i was fortunate to recover from it it could have been pretty difficult because especially in a cb cloud you can get thrown around quite badly and also the aircraft can even get broken up if you get right into a, the heart of a cb so that was a real scary but <laughs> exciting experience that i had wow, in a big 21 yeah. then the other part was the night night strike you know we were one of the first lot to start doing night attacks on the mig 21s so we used to go to the sidwan khas range which are near halwara and do night uh, firing on the time and it was the uh, initial days when you know people are not fired at night So it was challenging to find your own ways of how do you get onto the correct ranges and you know how to do your targeting and all that thing, in the, because nobody had done night strikes before. So that was interesting. And these were rockets that you were firing, or rockets and guns, both. Of we used to fire mainly. No, we never fired guns at night. We fired only rockets and bombs at night. Yeah, but it could be depending on the type of aircraft. You do either uh, dive bombing. or you do level bombing practice you know pretty much so this is what we used to do in terms of night strike and sometimes if you were lucky you could also get a chance to carry out certain trials like i distinctly remember one trial which we did which was being uh, conducted by then 
ഒരു ക്യാപ്റ്റൻ എ വൈ ടെഫ്നെസ് ഇലസ്ട്രേഷൻ അച്ചീവ് ആൻഡ് ഇറ്റ് വാസ് എ ട്രയൽ ടു ചെക്ക് ഔട്ട് ദ പെർഫോമൻസ് ഓഫ് ടു പെർട്ടിക്കുലർ മിസൈൽസ് കോൾ ആർ തേർട്ടീൻ മിസൈൽ ആർ ഫൈവ് ഫൈവ് സീറോ മാജിക് മിസൈൽ so tipi sir was the one who was controlling this entire trials and i happened to be one of the squadron pilots taken to participate in the trial so that was tremendously interesting also so um, tell us about dissimilar combat uh, um, which aircraft have you done dissimilar combat against and what were some of the outcomes or experiences yeah dissimilar combat uh, initial days uh, we started off with actually the big 21 was the main aircraft we used to fly against but we used to fly a big 21 against a nat say or a big 21 against a, a, a hunter class of aircraft then a big 21 against maybe a big 23 type of aircraft so various type of, depending on of course the which all type of aircraft happen to be based on a particular a base so because that is a is not convenient mainly because you know, you're only able to fly against an aeroplane which is based in the same uh, air base you know so mainly but the challenge actually in terms of training is to depending on the role that your, the aeroplane is expected to do that means if you are a, in an air defense aeroplane you will normally do a dissimilar air combat training against an air defense aeroplane and uh, and a craft which are essentially meant for bombing roles are, do not really get into too much of dissimilar air combat training other than defensive training so dissimilar air combat training is normally done by uh, like i said air defense aircraft against air defense aircraft ideally uh, of course bombers don't generally fight against bombers but something to taking a leave for what what actually happened in in the world war 2 etc so but in the training period this is how you do it yeah so uh, mig 21 against the nat what was that like very very tricky the nat was a tremendous aeroplane and we, have, we all know about the performance during 71 war people of the likes of uh, roy massey and uh, ganapati and uh, of, of, of such people and the nat firstly was a very small aeroplane difficult to spot and you know maneuver in relation to and so the big 21 versus the nat was a very interesting and very challenging for the big 21 but that you always find i should always maintain that the nat pilots are one of the best in terms of the combat sense mm-hmm. why is that because of the, maybe the the nat is actually you know is like strapping on an aeroplane to your body because it's a, such a beautifully agile uh, uh, platform and uh, very easy to fly you know everything is uh, very convenient i was i never flew it unfortunately because i was too tall to sit in a nat cockpit so that right. height, height limitation for it and uh, otherwise it's uh, it was such a tremendous uh, experience to even fly against them because you know to keep a, uh, the nat aircraft in sight during combat was a big issue you know for, for normal pilots yes So just you know give me a sense for uh, and if you can remember a memorable sortie doing the similar combat against a nat so you start off uh, in the old days in your time it used to be a breast and what do you what are the radio calls that you give to start the fight and then who, who calls when you've killed what are the what are the sort of radio calls that happen through yeah so you 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 position a, a breast of each other and uh, it is and uh, your uh, your situation starts with a call by the whoever is the leader saying that combat combat go and then you turn into each other normally because you turn into each other then you cross head on and the rafters start maneuvering in the vertical legs and the and the horizontal to get the better of the other aeroplanes in terms of the the you know the parameters and you get into a situation like the tail chase position so you ideally want to get into that so Correct. so how good you are in maneuvering your aeroplane across the entire spectrum of its capability of maneuvering uh, and depending on the differential between the aeroplanes also like the nat is maybe better in terms of because it can turn tighter also it can even uh, climb and at some stage you know like a mig 21 could get into if you get into a a low speed situation mig 21 is a 
virtually a sitting duck. Not a gnat so much. If a gnat mm -hmm. can take on aircraft like the sabers, like in 71, some of the most challenging combat engagements were between, you know, the sabers and some of our aeroplanes. Because the saber had a, firstly, a tremendous gun spread and it had a tremendous maneuverability at low speeds because of thick wings and things like that. MiG-21 didn't have the advantage of that because of the delta wing. So it's basically at low speeds, it was not uh, much use in combat. And so you had kind of developed your own bag of tricks based on the exploiting the strengths of your aircraft relative to the weaknesses. A absolutely. Absolutely. That's how you do it. But I still remember when I was in, posted on the staff in TACD, the Tactics and Combat Development Establishment in Jamnagar. And we actually did the trials on the Mirages when they first came into the Indian Air Force. And with the MiG-21s, I dare say we were able to teach the Mirage guys the lesson or two. Because, see, the combat principles don't vary. If you make mistakes, you may have a superior aeroplane. But after all, the man in the cockpit also makes a difference. That means if you make a mistake, then you could walk into a trap set by a, a, a supposedly inferior air platform otherwise. Can you tell us any specific, can you recount any specific sorties where you got the... Yes, we, we flew, we were of course, uh, I, maybe we should admit that guys who were flying in Tagdi are very experienced people. You were the top guns, absolutely. The top guns of the F. Yes, the guys, guys were all the guys who had done very well in the courses and their, their basic uh, combat capability was of a high order. So we, we actually weaved circles around the, uh, on the mirages. And I still remember when we were writing the report of the thing, because we wanted to put it in a manner that we wanted to keep it professional and not the, the ego should not get into the thing. But we had a very nice uh, kind of uh, uh, trial carried out, I remember, with the uh, the likes of a Marshal Bhavnani at that time and, you know, people like uh, H.G. Marshal Charlie Brown over there. And so, you know, guys like us who were the uh, comparatively junior lot, but, you know, guys with enough experience, we benefited tremendously from this kind of trials. Fascinating. And, you know, obviously we don't have the sort of aircraft that our adversary countries have, but how would you... Um, develop tactics or planning and teach people how to deal with a particular type? Yes. Basically, uh, your tactics that we should develop, uh, either in tag D or otherwise, which is carried forward thereafter by the people who do the courses and go back to the squadrons, are depending on the weapon system which is uh, carried by an aeroplane. That means initially, like, we, like I told you, we were in the gun era. We should always maneuver for a tactical solution to achieve a gun kill. Thereafter, we got into what is called the A4M stage. That means uh, uh, air to air, you know, where the missile could fire head on. So those kind of situations and the tactics had to change, undergo a sea change. So basically now, of course, you have uh, beyond visual range capabilities. So the entire tactics, depending on the beyond visual range situation and getting into closer, the visual bubble and other uh, uh, close combat missiles and uh, gun situation if the opportunity presents itself during a combat situation. So the tactics are developed depending on the, on the weapons that an uh, adversary or you have, you're carrying. Right. And um, so tell me about the Type 96 and then the BIS and then the Bison. What were some of these upgrades to the MiG? And uh, you've probably not flown the Bison, but you've, I'm sure, flown all the others. And as a pilot, what difference did... No, I haven't flown the Bison, but the Bison was being uh, in the works when I was very much in the Air Force and before I went off to Pakistan for a diplomatic tenure. So the Bison, I'm aware of the capabilities of the Bison. Bison is a superior aeroplane. In fact, there's nothing like a MiG-21 in terms of capability, the original MiG-21 in terms of combat capability. It had a very superior copio radar. It had uh, better missile systems. It had uh, radar warning receivers, you know, and uh, so all the, the sighting system was totally different. The inertial nav system was different. So Bison was a totally different ball game altogether. And we, it was shown uh, recently when the Abhinandan got a skill on the MiG-20, on the F-16 of the Pakistan Air Force. Because uh, so if, it, if, if any other airplane comes in front and makes a mistake of coming into the 
the the, the combat uh, arena of uh, of the, of the uh, capability of an aircraft like the bison the radar missile uh, mixture then you are asking for trouble and this is something that india seems to have consistently done over the years is we've taken something and then we've taken other pieces of equipment or or uh, avionics or software and we've integrated them into a very potent absolutely in fact this is not we don't have the luxury of changing aeroplanes every now and then and when you do a entire post structure planning we actually plan for certain numbers of very high technology aircraft some of medium technology and some of low technology aeroplanes and we have to use all of them in war so it's quite possible that in fact even in the 71 war we used even aircraft like the howards with rockets you know so because that's a, that is what apr is all about so whatever you have you have to be smart about it and use it in a manner modify aeroplanes adapt them as required adapt your tactics as required to be able to achieve your combat efficiency and combat skills right, we can come to some of the courses that you did you know pai then you were an instructor in the pai school and then fighter combat leader and then uh, i think you were were you an instructor also? what do these courses teach and what did you learn and uh... yes yeah, my first course was actually a pai because the pai course was a pilot attack instructor attack course where you actually teach people how to use the aircraft as a weapon system both for air to air firing and for air to ground firing so this course in you know, the like after your father's era in 19 early 1960s when he was on the pa school staff after that for about 20 years plus the indian air force did not have this course at all for various reasons because you had the fcl course but there no pa course so there was a need felt to uh, buttress the basic uh, marksmanship skills of the fighter pilots so that is why this course started again so we were actually uh, guys who came in about 10 of us for this course uh, very good guys were all individually excellent and uh, to be very frank i was one of the guys who were maybe struggling at the initial stages because uh, in terms of you know, sheer uh, experience and capability but managed to cope up in the thing and of course uh, finally did well in the course and that is how i got posted on the staff of tactics and after i got posted there as a pai then i did the, was inducted into the next fcl course which i topped and I carried on in the uh, fcl uh, directing staff of tacti and so um tacti for those of you who don't know what it is is the tactics and air combat development establishment it is india's equivalent to the top gun school it is the school that teaches tactics and combat develops new tactics for yeah it used to be in our time in jamnagar the beautiful area we had uh, the range next door and you know the beautiful uh, flying area and but later on it moved to gwalior and it is right now located in gwalior because it's also got the electronic ranges there now and because things have moved on in terms of technology so they are located now in gwalior mm -hmm. and what is an fcl course what did they teach you there a fighter combat leader course is uh, actually uh, something which uh, uh, you know every every leading air force wants to have because that actually teaches uh, a, a experienced pilot the nuances of air combat maneuvering and air to ground work all put into one that means what you are expected to do as a fighter pilot during war is taught in the fcl course so it's a three month course where you are put through the mill and you do entire lot of uh, air to air air to ground work ground school and you also do uh, you 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 fly uh, combat missions in groups and it will be for the first time that some people have flown exercise like the three versus two four versus two those kind of situations escort versus cap versus strike which you know where several aircraft are milling around in the same sky so your air situation awareness improves tremendously and a guy who comes out of an fcl course is a different uh, uh, kettle of fish altogether in terms of capability and combat awareness now 
you know, one of the things that I've noticed, uh, you know, the world in 2020 or 2021, we're talking about, uh, you know, not measuring people, not performing appraisals and, you know, things like that. But I find in the fighter flying world, particularly, you live and die by how good you are with respect to the others, by your performance in, say, you know, bomb aiming accuracy or gunnery accuracy or rocket attack accuracy and the numbers. Uh, there's a you know big focus on metrics, measurement, comparison. Uh, and it's almost, uh, you know, a very uh, uh, a primal sort of uh, uh, an environment. Uh, what do you think about that? Or is that characterization correct? There is a saying in the amongst fighter pilots, they said there are there can be old pilots, they can be bold pilots, but there are no old and bold pilots. So uh, actually experience is one part of it where you learn. But yes, ego and what we refer to colloquially as your cockpit reputation is very important for a fighter pilot. Not only for his ego, but also for his general professional reckoning and the way he is seen by, the, by his peers by your superiors and that is how you either progress or stagnate you can also stagnate if you don't perform properly so performance like in any career you are expected to perform so here yes it does tend to be a little bit more on uh, not really a macho image but your actual capability to maneuver that aeroplane and use it as a weapon so that can only happen when you are able to think through the entire process of uh, how this aircraft could be taken to this kind of a situation, how you could get into a, achieve a tactical solution in the manner that you want to do. And you're doing all that by actually flying, sitting in the cockpit and flying in that half an hour, 45 minutes that the sortie demands. Yeah, you know, I you didn't mean that in a, uh, in an egotistical way, but in a quiet professional pride way. I think that's what I've seen uh, as people have a quiet professional pride. And I think partly that's because the margin for error and the, you know, the opportunity window for you to get a kill on the other and the opportunity window for him to get a kill on you is so tiny and small that on the spot, if you're not on your game, it's, uh, it's a Absolutely, absolutely. So, like I say, while ego is important, it is actually a professional skill that skill that counts. And uh, yes, you can't you can't uh, uh, you can't go on the wrong side of the curve and think that nobody else can sort of outdo me because that again would be an undoing. So yes, you have to have a, a very uh, humble way of going about your uh, own capabilities, which you honed over a period of number of sorties and you know your own flying. And your exposure, like uh, so, sometimes it happens that you do get, you are, you are put into a, a melee where you get exposed to the kind of exercises that uh, teaches you things in air combat and uh, aircraft maneuvering. And some people pass don't get the chance to do that. So you can't really equate one to the other. But what you're saying is absolutely right. It is a is a question of a, a pride in your job, in a good sense, definitely not in a bad sense. Right, sir. Can we change gears and come to the MiG-23? What was your introduction to the MiG-23 and how was it uh, to operate that aircraft, operate it in lay, which, you know, owns, what are the sorts of challenges that you all faced? And how yes, yeah, MiG-23, as you know, the first uh, swing wing fighter that the Indian Air Force got. And we were the baby one of the initial lot who got trained in India. I didn't go to Russia for it. A lot of people went to Russia for it. And uh, the ground attack version was a beautiful aircraft, but very tricky in some respects in terms of, especially after a MiG-21, when you fly a MiG-23, you know, you, you, there are challenges during the landing approach and things like that. But you overcome that and because the engine was so powerful and then you, had, you, know, you, you learned to do that. And that's, that's what actually helped the aircraft to operate uh, easily from Lay, which as you know is at uh, an altitude of over 3 kilometers, 3.1 kilometers or so. So, uh, 
then thereafter i got to uh, command a mic 23 mm squad which is an a different squad which was even more powerful than the mic 23 bn and uh, of course that the uh, defense attributes in terms of radar and missiles and things like that so that was a tremendously challenging thing because uh, it, at, uh, at the aircraft that time when when i commanded was pretty old by itself but uh, we still managed to do lots of interesting stuff in terms of uh, operating from lay once again because of the powerful engine one was able to do that and uh, yes uh, the b23 was definitely uh, it, it shade better than the mig 21 in terms of pure capability at that in that era but uh, the aqua the mig 21 had like i said it was a was a sports model by itself right and the mig 23 was like the jaguar a deep penetration strike aircraft or was it more for close air support and no the mig 23 had a issue with range because like all russian aircraft and because the engine was mainly gas guzzlers so it did not have much of a range compared to a jaguar a jaguar could go it was actually a deep penetration strike aircraft the mig 23 was not meant to be a deep penetration strike aircraft but uh, you could of course carry wing tanks and go a little further and things like that but it is uh, definitely not a comparison for the jaguar jaguar is much in a different uh, 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 what do you call category or to the end of the capability of uh, deep penetration you would be able to easily go supersonic at uh, low level is what i hear yes yes because the engine was so powerful and uh, but then because it uh, the engine being powerful is one aspect but it operates very close to the surge line so you could get into trouble especially if you ingest something into the engine or you burn it or things like that then the engines you know surges and it before you realize actually it is melting away and you know falling off behind so that is a dangerous part of having a very superiorly uh, you know high performance kind of a jet engine in an aircraft like the mig 23 right. i remember reading this article about landing a mig 23 in lay for the first time and how there were ground speed uh, and tire limitations and so you had to keep the nose till the aircraft slowed down and then lower the nose wheel because that had a lower speed limitation absolutely right actually if i remember right the tire limitation used to be 400 uh, true air speed so like i told you about mig 21 uh, that the threshold speed is 340 and you test on around 300 or whatever whereas the mig 23 your your test on speed was a little lower maybe closer to 270 or something as it is normally on a on a level on a on a sea level air base but when you go high then your true air speed as it tends to go up so you cannot definitely not allow to do, uh, can't do a high speed landing but even for a normal speed landing like you very rightly said you de- you tend to lower the nose much lower because otherwise the, uh, the nose wheel is comparatively weaker than uh, the main wheel so you have to wait and also all the landings there have to be shooted landings which in any case uh, mi 23 is uh, always use shoots for the landing because uh, that's a better way rather than you know Uh, eating upon your ceramic disc of your brakes is better to use shoots for every landing. Yeah, right. So wonderful. So uh, you were talking about command and how beautiful command was, and everybody I've spoken to, you know, lives and dies for command of a fighter squadron. So what is so special about it? What was that experience? You know, you have about twenty pilots under you. You have about. Five to seven technical officers. You have a doctor. You know, there are several people put together, and you have to deliver as a combat unit. So you have your orders in terms of your war plans and things like that from the station people, your command people. Your job is to hold that team together as a a combat efficient unit, and a lot of it is to do with man management. So. you have young people who come in they don't have much of experience they have to be taken through the paces you have to literally live their life with them understand the kind of problems they likely to be having either on the personal front or on the professional front and help them overcome that the easiest thing is to be tough on them and say that no you're not performing no we will not uh, tolerate any more no you have to take them along with you so that you have uh, over a period of time you find when you find the people is more, the best satisfaction as commanding officer gets when he 
when a youngster comes into a squadron virtually like a greenhorn from a training uh, squadron or the big 21 or other types and you put him through the paces and then he over time he starts maturing as a proficient combat pilot and how many years was your command tenure command tenure was uh, normally the tenure is 3 years but then it started reducing in my case i think it was slightly over 2 and a half years or so i commanded so in the time that we have left i know i've taken a lot of your time can you tell me about that experience writing the doctrine of the air force and for those who are not familiar with the term what is the doctrine of the air force and how did you go well that was uh, once again you know uh, god's grace that one got a chance to be involved in that i had finished my command and then uh, there was a pe- certain period of time to they till i picked up my rank so they were they formed a team the chief at that time was hc marshal uh, supi call he was very keen that uh, the indian air force comes out with uh, a, a doctrine which actually is a bible which says as what is the indian air force expected to do so it is not only meant for members of the indian air force to relate to the bigger mission of the air force it's also meant for the government for your bureaucrats and everybody else also to realize it. this is what the air force is meant to do this is the kind of campaigns the air force wages during war or during peace time and any you know other kind of things that the air force does so all these things is what uh, the doctrine spells out clearly is basically not really the nitty gritty in terms of you know uh, uh, how to do things but basically a kind of a bible which encapsulates uh, the missions and the goals of the indian air force fascinating and is this a, a restricted or a confidential document or is this generally available for the public no it, it actually when, when initially we wrote it it was actually uh, classified kept classified for reasons that time uh, the, the, the decision that was taken but now i believe it is a, it's a, a non classified document it's available on the net anybody can google i in the air force doctrine and read the thing about what is the air force expected to do all those things are available in the in the, in the open domain fascinating because in an earlier conversation you know we were talking about how the army in 71 didn't know the capabilities of the air force or exploit them fully and i'm thinking that a document like this doctrine of the iaf will actually help other people understand how they can use the air force absolutely in fact we were the first to write the doctrine out of all the three services and after us other other services also followed and also uh, i was part of the first joint service doctrine we we tried to write because now it has come out but that time we were having issues but now of course the service has gone long way as you know we have also a cds we are talking about joint re and fighting together and things like that but these are all uh, some 15 20 years back you know totally greek in terms of uh, uh, service uh, operating uh, norms you know so uh, yes doctrines do help in helping people to understand what the service can do and also enabling them to integrate with each other right sir now after leaving the service you now currently working on some very interesting use of airborne assets so would you like to talk a little bit about that yes actually uh, you know the problem is once when, when you retire how do you keep yourself busy so uh, that is in case you don't want to work you know, work in the, in the typical sense of trying to earn a salary or things like that but luckily we were uh, we don't we don't have that requirement to really earn but then to keep yourself uh, intellectually stimulated there are, so what i chose for myself was first to do a little bit of writing on the side which i have been doing for the tribune uh, off and on on uh, on uh, strategic issues and and about and we'll give will uh, you know with the show notes i think we'll attach a link to some of your articles so people yes thank you so uh, in fact those, those that is something which uh, which has kept me going because uh, the tribune has been good enough to publish whenever i write something on strategic issues and the air force aspects especially and uh, the second thing which uh, because i stay in the in himachal pradesh in an air force colony and uh, we wanted to at this stage give back something to society and we felt that uh, the latest thing being the latest not fad but the latest uh, uh, technology wise uh, something which is going to help society is a drone as you know 
So in Himachal, having the typical terrain that it has, uh, we were right now we are working on a project which is uh, in the offing that we are going to be having a, a pilot project launched in a couple of uh, weeks from now in uh, in Mandi in Himachal Pradesh, where we are going to use a drone to uh, to to carry uh, human sputum to try and cut down the time frame for tuberculosis uh, uh, management. And uh, because Himachal has got a big issue with tuberculosis uh, in the in the hinterland. So that is, we, are, we want to use drones to cut down the time frame. Right now, they're using it by taking it on foot and by motorcycle and other things like that. So drone will be tremendously helpful, we feel, in terms of reducing the cost and the, yeah, bettering the time limit from the uh, picking up a likely case to treating the case at the, at the, at the medical center. So we are just in the thick of it. So we hoping that it works out and uh, the state also support. State is of course supporting it, but we need to, uh, you know, finally get the thing going as a viable proposition down the line. That's amazing. I wish you all the very best. It sounds like a really exciting and socially relevant project uh, whose time has come, perhaps in terms of how technology. Yes. Thank you, Guns. Thanks. Right, so we've taken a lot of your time. I want to thank you for your service. I want to thank you for the time you've taken today and how uh, passionately you've spoken about your career in the Air Force, but also your love for the MiG-21 and MiG-23 aircraft that you've flown. Uh, wish you all the very best in your ventures and uh, thank you again. Thank you so much, Gans. Uh, you, you, you're an Air Force kid and we have, we have a special bond with you. I've seen you literally running around in shorts when in the, the days when I was starting my flying. So it's a, it's a tremendous experience to interact with you. Thank you so much. Well, folks, that's all we have time for this week. Join us again next week. In the meantime, sign up for updates at blueskiespodcast.com. There you'll find links to follow us on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. You can also write to us with your comments, questions, suggestions and feedback from the website or to blueskies at prganapati.com. Subscribe to the podcast on any podcasting platform such as Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Apple Podcasts and even on YouTube. If you like what you heard, Share it with your friends, give us a rating in your favorite podcasting app, and write us a review. It will help other people find us. I want to give my thanks to Saurav Chaudhia for our logo and Prithvik for the music. I want to reiterate that all the views expressed here are personal, and this podcast has not been approved by or reviewed by the Air Force, Ministry of Defense, or any branch of the government. In the meantime, stay safe. Enjoy it.